Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 3647 in the name of Ivan McKee on subsidy control bill UK legislation. I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Ivan McKee, Minister, to speak too and to move the motion around seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank you for this opportunity to debate the proposed UK Government legislation and the implications of this on devolved powers. And before I forget, I will take this opportunity also to move the motion at this point in time. Uh, the UK Government's interim subsidy control regime came into effect on the UK's exit from EU membership. The UK, of course, must adhere to international obligations on subsidies agreed under free trade agreements. Um, the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, and of course the Northern Ireland Protocol. And public sector organisations must ensure that subsidies comply with the relevant rules. Importantly, agriculture and fishery sectors are excluded from the TCA and operate under World Trade Organisation WTO rules. The UK Internal Market Act was introduced on 17 December 2020. It completely overrides the devolution settlement by reserving subsidy control and giving UK ministers powers to spend directly in devolved areas without the oversight and consent of this Scottish Parliament and Scottish ministers. This has already been seen in the case of the Professional Qualifications Bill debated in this chamber on 10 February and for which we have also refused legislative consent. The UK Government introduced the subsidy control bill to Parliament on 30 June 2021. Paul Scully, the Minister for Small Business, wrote to me at the end of June asking if Scottish ministers would be content in principle to begin the legislative consent process in the Scottish Parliament. The LCM was introduced on 25th of October. President officer, we do not propose to give consent, and I will outline why. The bill, if adopted, brings further erosion of devolution through the sweeping powers of the Secretary of State, which overrides the devolution settlement and risks UK ministers intervening without proper knowledge or consultation around local circumstances. The subsidy control bill empowers the base Secretary of State to refer subsidies and schemes in policy areas of devolved competence to the appointed independent body, the Competition and Markets Authority, where the subsidy has not yet been awarded or the scheme has not yet been made. A cooler off period will kick in. The Secretary of State has the power to extend this period without consulting devolved administrations. If enacted, this would undermine the long-established powers of the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Ministers to act in relation to matters within devolved competence, such as economic development, the environment, agriculture and fisheries. The Scottish Government has argued for devolved administrations to have equivalent powers to refer subsidies made in other parts of the UK or even by public authorities in their own jurisdictions to the CMA. The UK Government have consistently rejected this proposal. The absence of formal regulatory and enforcement arrangements undermines confidence in the process for grant awarding bodies and recipients. The measures proposed in the Bill are weak, particularly given the proposed advisory role of the CMA. We continue to press for prior appraisal of awards within a detailed regulatory framework to provide greater certainty on what support will be compatible with the UK's subsidy control regime. This is essential for both subsidy awarding bodies and businesses investing in Scotland and the UK. We firmly oppose the inclusion of agriculture in the permanent regime. Agriculture is fully devolved. Farmers and crofters in Scotland face challenges not found elsewhere in the UK. Yet the principle set out in Schedule 1 of the Bill risks constraining our ability to develop future policies that are tailored to the needs of Scottish agriculture. For example, income and couple support payments play an essential role in supporting many of the businesses operating in our most remote and constrained areas. However, they appear incompatible with some of the proposed principles, especially Principle F, competition and investment within the UK. The UK Government has pressed on, however, ignoring our concerns. The Bill and the internal market principle in particular risk making the common framework process redundant, putting legislative restrictions on policy divergence within the UK rather than managing it through an established mutual cooperation via the framework. These concerns are supported by the House of Lords Common Framework Scrutiny Committee. My colleague Mary Goujon, Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Islands, wrote to Bayes Minister Paul Scully in June 2021 and to DEFRA Secretary of State George Eustace in November, setting out our concerns 
and proposing the bill be amended to exclude agriculture from its scope. George Eustace replied in January, stating that in his view the new domestic regime will protect competition and investment in all parts of the UK. However, he did not address our substantive concerns of incompatibility with the principles or impact on the common framework process. The potential lack of transparency, uh, the bill originally proposed that awarding bodies would have six months to place information on the database and interested parties would have one month to appeal. However, earlier this week I received a letter from Minister Scully informing me that this has been amended and awarding bodies will now be required to place information on the database within three months. A small and welcome concession, and although other minor technical amendments have been proposed, this goes nowhere near addressing our grave concerns regarding this bill. We still consider that the time limit for challenge should be increased to a more realistic period. I have addressed a number of specific concerns, however, the overarching theme is that the bill remains high level. The crucial detail, including draft subordinate legislation and in-depth guidance, is lacking. Its absence makes it difficult to take a considered view. The subsidy control bill, as it stands, proposes broad powers to the Secretary of State, shaping the future regime with little scrutiny from the UK Parliament and no scrutiny by devolved administrations. I move that this Parliament backs the motion, refuses legislative consent to the bill as it stands, and backs our request for appropriate amendments to be made to the bill that respects this Parliament's role in devolved competencies. Thank you. Sign off, sir. Thank you. I now call on Claire Baker on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Um, thank four, four minutes, please, Thank Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to speak on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. We considered the LCM on subsidy control bill at two evidence sessions in January, hearing first from academics, legal experts and COSLA on the ramifications of the bill, followed by evidence from the Minister. We published our report on the 9th of February. Our report does raise concerns about the Scottish Government's engagement with us. Uh, though the bill was introduced in the House of Commons on the 30th of June 2021, the Scottish Government did not lodge its LCM until almost four months later. We did not receive a clear explanation for this. This delay curtailed the committee's opportunity for scrutiny. This is unsatisfactory and I have raised it with the conveners group. But to turn to the bill. The committee accepts that there must be a subsidy control regime in the UK and we welcome the flexibility provided in the bill's proposals for a baseline legal framework for the award of subsidies. The Law Society said the bill creates a welcome opportunity for schemes tailored to Scottish circumstances. However, the report agrees with the Scottish Government on a number of points, and we note that the Scottish Government cannot recommend to the Scottish Parliament it gives consent to the bill. The Committee shares the concerns that the bill gives considerable powers to UK ministers which operate across the devolution settlement, impacting on areas of devolved competence. We share the concerns that this will potentially result in UK ministers having the ability to intervene in devolved areas without proper consultation or knowledge of local circumstances. Our witness panel highlighted the asymmetry of power between the UK and devolved governments created by the bill, which the majority of the committee agreed was a concern. I would stress the committee's concerns relate solely to the areas which are devolved. We are concerned that smaller organisations and community groups may find the new regime harder to navigate, being at a disadvantage to those with greater access to administrative and legal resources. There are concerns that changes will lead to excessive caution, which will stop investment. While there are promises of streamlined and fast-track subsidy award pathways, and while the UK Government is now consulting with the Scottish Government on schemes, the majority of the committee agreed that Scottish ministers should have the power to introduce schemes in devolved areas. We also heard the bill makes changes to the devolution settlement concerning the status of acts of the Scottish Parliament, their susceptibility to judicial review and interpretation. The majority of the committee is concerned by these developments and we would urge the Constitution Committee to continue work in this area. The majority of the committee is concerned that much of the detail of how the new subsidy control regime will operate is not on the face of the bill, but rather will be detailed in secondary legislation and guidance, centralising decision making and not supporting scrutiny. It is frustrating that while legislation resulting from the exit from the EU could be used to recognise and support the devolution settlement, is instead, I'm afraid, reinforcing a blinkered approach. The government notes that the Scottish ministers, sorry, the committee notes that Scottish ministers will not have equivalent powers to the Secretary of State in having the ability to reverse certain subsidies or schemes to the Competition and Markets Authority. These are concerns shared by the Welsh government that this does not reflect the interests of devolved administrations. The committee supports the Scottish government's call in the LCM for equivalent powers for devolved administrations to defer subsidies made in other parts of the UK to the Competition and Markets Authority. 
Final point. It is evident that, for whatever reason, Scotland spends significantly more on enterprise and economic development in the UK as a whole. This spending is likely to be registered as subsidy under the Bill, so the Bill is anticipated to have a bigger impact on Scotland. The Committee is also concerned that in the absence of clarity, this will create significant scope for conflict between the Scottish and UK governments, which, frankly, President Officer, there can be enough of without manufacturing more. All efforts must be made to minimise these concerns and work in cooperation if any of the proposed opportunities in the Bill are to be realised. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Jamie Halker Johnson on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Subsidy control is a key part of ensuring an open, competitive and fair market economy. This piece of UK legislation tackles a vital missing part of the legislative framework for the maintenance of a coherent UK market after our departure from the European Union. We were, of course, previously governed by the EU state aid requirements, and it's been a lengthy and often complex process so far in bringing such controls into our domestic law. The maintenance of continuing regu regulation of state aid is a requirement that has been formalised between the UK and the EU as part of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, underlying the UK's continued links with the EU single market. But it's also a system that will have a, a wide-ranging impact on a number of bodies across this country. The Economy and Fair Work Committee has looked at this area in some detail, and our report from February uh, is on the record. How Sorry, I thought I was being asked for an intervention. Uh, yes. Fiona Hislop. Does the member acknowledge that not only does this bill uh, drive a coach and horses through devolution, in fact, the NUF, uh, NFU Scotland's uh, statement was one of the strongest I've ever seen about saying it, it damages devolution. But even on a practical level, we need subsidy control. But this bill is deficient in a number of measures that will make it... Um, more, uh, le make it less favourable to uh, competition and could actually hinder our investment in net zero and actually you know, cause risk aversion in terms of partnership funding uh, for important uh, local community projects. Uh, uh, Mr Harcourt Johnson? Uh, no, I don't. Um, and um, I hope, hopefully, the, um, the member will be making that in an elongated speech later. But um, I don't agree with that and I will be covering some of the, the concerns that I do have with the bill a little bit later. Um, However, it's worth noting that the unanimous conclusion of the committee that the Scottish Government's delay in lodging its legislative consent uh, memorandum curtailed this committee's opportunity for scrutiny, as the uh, committee convener highlighted. An LCM was lodged in the Welsh Senate in mid-July, allowing time for greater uh, exploration of the bill. Here, we had to wait until late October. And there's not been, as the committee concluded, a satisfactory explanation for that delay yet. Because this is a significant set of proposals, it's one part of recreating the structures of our internal market, if not quite from scratch, and certainly with a fresh start. It is the case that this bill in many ways sets a framework to be further expanded by means of secondary leg legislation and guidance. And there has been comment from the devolved administrations and parliaments, as well as within the UK Parliament, noting disappointment that the bill before us is lacking in some detail. While acknowledging that the bill will not be the last word on subsidy control, there is a reasonable case that this lack of detail in primary legislation has made scrutiny more difficult, notwithstanding the late stage at which it came to this Parliament. However, this is, and I hope the Chamber recognises, a necessary bill, one that ensures the integrity of the UK internal market, as well as meeting our international obligations. We can see the evidence of the chilling effects of uncertainty in subsidy provision, with public bodies erring on the side of caution to avoid legal challenge. That certainty must be returned, but we, we agree that the bill alone cannot provide this, which gives the associated guidance and secondary legislation a position of considerable importance. What must, however, be satisfied is a degree of certainty for public bodies to operate within. The committee heard a number of examples of the positives of the framework which the bill sets out. It's greater flexibility, greater autonomy in decision-making to local bodies, and as a resultant ability to make decisions with greater speed and responsiveness. My own region, the Highlands and Islands, is one where population density in particular makes state support a more regular requirement to secure the sort of policy objections this Parliament wishes to see. We know all too well the rigidities of state aid rules and the lengthy processes it has required in notifications to the European Commu uh, Commission. While maintaining a system of fairness and integrity, it's my hope that the new subsidy control regime will go some way towards addressing these issues. But to return to the concerns about detail, additional flexibility will, of course, not answer wider questions of policy. 
Within the EU state aid regime, there existed many different approaches taken by the government to the various member states, and there will remain political questions over where support should go about obtaining real value for taxpayers' money. In the last session of, the, of this Parliament, I was involved in the former Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee's Business Support Inquiry, which is a good body of work that deals with one small area of subsidy. There will be choices in this Parliament about how to deploy subsidies effectively, and there is a much wider discussion to be had about how we do so. Responding to the consultation on subsidy control last summer, the Business Secretary cautioned against damaging subsidy, such as unlimited subsidies to shore up failing companies, where there is no plan for their restructure. But of course, subsidy is largely used in a positive way, and, we, and will, we hope, increasingly be seen in that light, supporting economic recovery, achieving policies like net zero, and the sort of levelling up that needs to happen both across the United Kingdom as a whole and within Scotland too. The Economy and Fair Work Committee has, of course, recognised some of the shortcomings in this area, and we need more clarity on how existing objectives will align with the new subsidy control scheme. This Parliament is certainly correct in its wish to see further information from the UK Government on these points. We also recognise some of the points made about asymmetry. While it should be emphasised that we are considering an area reserved to the UK Parliament, and one in which we should le legitimately expect UK Ministers to be able to act for the whole of the United Kingdom, we do recognise that there is a reasonable argument to grant referral powers to the, uh, to the Competition and Markets Authority to have devolved Ministers as well as the Secretary of State. Presiding officer, we acknowledge the significance, the significance of the change that this bill brings, as well as the number of concerns that have been raised across this chamber, as well as the remaining uncertainty within a number of organisations and bodies across Scotland. However, we do not accept the position of the Scottish Government that any of these points should be fatal to the bill's progress. It has set out a positive direction for subsidy control within the UK, albeit one that requires additional clarity. I welcome the engagement between governments that has already taken place, for the fleshing out of future subsidy controls to take place, this must continue and go wider still. Thank you. I now call on Daniel Johnson on behalf of Scottish Labour, and Mr Johnson is joining us remotely. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I apologise for joining late? I've been having some network issues at home, and hence the cable that you see uh, running uh, over my left shoulder. Indeed, let me give you the short version, just in case I, I get cut off. And where I agree with Jamie Halcrow Johnson it is that this is a necessary bit of regulation. Uh, we need an overarching framework and regulation for subsidy across the United Kingdom uh, since we have uh, withdrawn from uh, the European Union. But I think his acknowledgement of the need for, as he put it, clarity also points to the deficiencies in the approach taken by the UK government. The approach taken lacks transparency and fails to take due consideration for the devolved government and arrangements we have across the United Kingdom. And so doing this legislation is deficient and therefore Scottish Labour cannot support it and will be voting for the motion to withhold consent for this at decision time uh, this evening. This was an opportunity to rethink subsidies, to rethink the relationship between industry, enterprise and government. But ultimately, the UK government has failed to do that, failed to seize that opportunity. What's more, the plans do not target regions or sectors with subsidies, and there are no measures for using subsidies to help tackle regional inequality, the levelling up that the UK government professes to care so much about. The bill lacks transparency needed to ensure that taxpayers' money is spent well. The Law Society of Scotland share this view that a well-functioning subsidy control regime must be based on clear rules that provide legal certainty to businesses and granting authorities and is one that implements a regime that is clear, proportionate and gives businesses and local authorities the tools needed to operate confidently within it. Critically, though, it is this lack of respect for devolution that is most troubling. We raise these concerns uh, uh, in Westminster and also note the concerns raised by the Economy Fair Work Committee about the lack of devolved engagement and the asymmetry of power between the UK government and Scottish government. This was an opportunity to perhaps enhance devolution and thereby strengthen it. However, yet again, the UK government has shown that it either does not understand devolution or perhaps it just does not care about it. And the House of Commons Labour tabled six amendments to ensure that the devolved administrations 
who are given a meaningful role in the design and implementation of a new subsidy regime. And whilst we understand that the power over a UK-wide subsidy should ultimately rest with Westminster, we also recognise that it is a vital role uh, and vital that all nations of the UK are involved in this regime. Currently, the bill fails to respect the revol uh, role of devolved nations and does not give them a meaningful seat at the table. We put forward an amendment that would require the Secretary of State to seek the consent of the devolved administrations before making res regulations that define the terms of subsidies and those subsidies deemed to be of uh, particular interest, because we believe that the devolved administration should be a, a partner in making uh, these decisions and these definitions. These were reasonable amendments, but were defeated, and we therefore, uh, as a UK Labour Party, abstained at the second reading of the bill. We have to ensure we get this right. Poorly designed subsidies can give businesses an unfair advantage, uh, trigger subsidy races and create a risk of international trade disputes. Good subsidies, on the other hand, can help achieve policy objectives, boost regional growth and encourage research and development. And indeed, hist historically, the UK has spent significantly less on subsidies than other EU member states. In 2019, for example, the UK spent just 0.5% of GDP on subsidies, whilst France spent 0.85% and Germany spent over 1.5% of GDP. On average, EU member states spent 63% uh, more of their GDP on state aid than the UK. While a UK-wide system of subsidy control is needed and necessary, we are concerned that the lack of uh, the role given to devolved administrations under this uh, proposed regime fatally undermines it. Labour believe that there is a need for a genuine four nations approach. We are also concerned that, uh, with the unworkable position of complete unilateral control over subsidies in Scotland that flies in the face of the required coordination within our UK single market. So while it is clear that some form of regulation is needed, this bill uh, cannot be uh, 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 supported because of its lack of transparency and because of its failure to take account and indeed enhance the devolved settlement across these islands. And therefore we will be voting with the government uh, to withhold consent for this bill at decision time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I now call on Willie Rennie on behalf of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I, I despair. This is the third debate in recent weeks that our two governments have found it incapable of reaching an agreement on something so fundamental to the operation of our country. We had the debate about the internal market, inability of the two governments to work together, the shared prosperity fund, inability of our two governments to work together. People deserve, I think, better than this constitutional argument, never ending constitutional argument. They expect more and they expect, I have to say, a bit of maturity from both sides, because both are as bad as each other. As Claire Baker referred in her contribution, there is an asymmetry of power and that does need to change. So I hope this is the last time that we have these kind of circumstances and that we actually get governments to try to work together for the benefit of people, because people deserve better. I understand that there's a, an important... Yes, yeah, certainly. Minister? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite uh, perplexed by Willie Rennie's approach here. We've just heard the Conservative members um, explaining the asymmetry in the bill and the, the deficiencies within the bill. Is he saying that we should just roll over and uh, not protect the devolution settlement and allow the UK government to do whatever it wants in devolved areas? Or should we stand up for Scotland and make sure that uh, those areas are protected and the interests of Scotland's economy are protected as a consequence? Willie Rennie. We probably wait and be a little less impatient and actually listen to what the contribution is going to be from myself, because what I'm making clear is that there is, of course, a need for a UK subsidy bill. We can't have a race to the bottom in the different nations and regions of the UK, just like we had with the European Union. But there does need to be a process of engagement between the nations and the regions of the UK, and that's what I'm calling for. I think there needs to be a federalist arrangement, as I've argued 
previously with the Share Prosperity Fund and also with the internal market arrangements, because we need to find ways of agreeing better together across the United Kingdom, rather than this, this approach that the SNP love to take, and also the Conservative government love to take, is the never-ending constitutional argument. People deserve better, and I am sure the Minister truly understands that. But there is some hope that the House of Lords, there is discussions in the House of Lords about a, perhaps a non-legislative route for agreement of these kind of issues. That gives us something constructive to work around. It's not been agreed yet, so we will be voting with the government this evening. We will be voting, not just now, we will be voting with the government this evening because we want to hold legislative consent because we, what we have just now in terms of the decision-making process is not adequate. But if we do get an agreement through the good work in the House of Lords, then I would hope that the government would come back and recognise that things had changed so we can give legislative consent because we need to try and work together. Of course, this is a very important bill because it will bring into sharp focus the Scottish Government's failure on industrial intervention, which I have rehearsed with the Minister previously over BIFAB, which collapsed, and over Lochaber, where we were promised 2,000 additional jobs, which have not materialised. So this will be the start of a wider debate, which I am sure the Minister will engage in. We need to have a proper arrangement across the United Kingdom. We can't afford to have a race to the bottom. We need to have effective subsidy control. Subsidy in a way that Daniel Johnson has talked about to make sure that we get the best out of it for the benefit of our economy and our people. But the current loggerhead approach of both the Conservative government and the SNP government does not serve people well. They deserve better. And I hope we can come back with better arrangements in future preferably a federalist solution, which we have argued for some time is the best way forward for the United Kingdom. Thank you. And I now call on Ivan McKee, Minister, to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And, and been a, an interesting, if a short uh, but welcome debate. And I'd like to thank members for their contributions. And I'll just touch on it. Uh, on those contributions very briefly before I move on to uh, conclude a very limited time. Um, Jamie Halker Johnston um, recognises the chilling effect that the lack of certainty within this bill has on the um, investment um, scenarios, and we've already seen examples of that in Scotland. So I'm glad that he recognises that and is critical of the bill in that regard. And he also recognises, and we've called for prior approval, uh, a proposal of awards to be uh, to be part of the process. The UK government has uh, refused to do that, and he also recognises the asymmetry inherent in the bill and why we are where we are with the challenges on devolution and our reasons for withholding uh, consent. Give way. Uh, Jimmy Halker Johnson. Thanks very much. Just to advise the Minister, I was referring to the uncertainty, the chilling effect of the uncertainty and why we need to get this bill through and sorted. Minister. Well, uncertainty is very clear. It's because businesses and, and, and award makers don't have prior approval of, uh, of awards, and that's the key element, one of the key elements in the, the functional aspects of this bill, and one of the reasons why we are refusing to, uh, to give consent to it. Please. Jim Fairley. Thank you very much, the Minister. Uh, Jamie Harker Johnson said in response to Fiona Hislop's question that he did not agree with her uh, uh, assertions. But I have got the NFU approach to the subsidy control bill here. Given the difference in approach regarding future funding already set up with the UK and Scottish governments, this bill is a risk to future rural policy development in Scotland. The oversight and controls already in place provide protection to the UK Internal Market Act against distortions. The subsidy control bill, together with the UK Internal Market Act, has the potential to seriously undermine Scottish agriculture, which is the turnkey for a thriving rural community. That is direct quotes from the NFU in Scotland. I, now, I, I, you I think, Mr. Fairley, the, the Minister Scotland has got the gist. Minister, big please, friends of ours, but please that's resume, Minister. Thank you. Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much for that intervention, and as always, he's a, an, an expert in this, uh, this, this, this uh, subject area. And uh, it is um, great that he's raising these uh, very, very important issues in that perspective from, uh, from NFU Scotland, which is hugely important. But as I said, Jamie Halker Johnson recognises the problems with this bill, recognises the asymmetry that is uh, contained within it, as does Daniel Johnson. Um, and um, I, I welcome his, uh, his comments uh, on that. He's right, it's a very important matter that needs to be taken forward, um, but he's also absolutely right that it further demonstrates 
that the UK government does not understand nor care about devolution, and that, in the end, will be their, uh, will be their undoing. Um, and uh, I thank Willie Rennie for his, uh, his comments, and we're glad that he's supporting our position on this as well. He continues to try to breathe, breathe life into the corpse of uh, federalism, and it's, it's, it's entertaining to watch that, uh, that process. But uh, the reality is that, uh, that that ship has long sailed. We have the choice between a UK government that's uh, determined to uh, remove the powers of the Scottish Parliament and, uh, and reduce the, um, uh, the, 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 the devolution, or we have us taken forward our agenda to make sure Scotland is a normal, independent country. Muscular unionism has uh, had its day. It's tried to do what it could do, and it's not, uh, not succeeded. The disconnects um, are within, uh, within the UK government. There are UK government ministers who are very comfortable and completely understand their position on this, but they have been told what to do by others within UK government who are determined to continue down that road of creating fights where there need to be none and creating a situation where even the Conservative members here recognise the, uh, the, the challenges and the problems with, the, with this particular bill. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I move that Parliament backs uh, the motion, refuses legislative consent to the bill as it stands, and ask Parliament to back our request, our request that the UK Government lodge suitable amendments as the bill progresses, so that it provides equivalent powers to Scottish ministers, removes agriculture from its scope, and requires the UK government to seek the consent of Scottish ministers if they plan legislation which would involve, which would impinge on devolved areas. I don't think that's too much to ask. I don't think Willie Rennie, frankly, would ask for any more. Where he's standing in my shoes, it's up to the UK government to take forward those changes, and then we can see where, where we get to in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes the debate on Subsidy Control Bill UK legislation. There will be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you.